there are people being killed all across the Middle East in so many different countries. I mean, there's now a civil war in Sudan. Why you don't see a protest in London about people killed in Sudan? Or about the Uyghurs? Your actual concentration Because from Because their land is not holy. It's simple as that. Is that the land where this cup, where this battle is happening, holds more value. Correct. It's kind of like when Wisconsin Electoral College has, I guess, eight times the votes of people living in New York. Right. It's kind of the same thing, is that many people are selective about which human rights care they care about or which people they care about based on, on the fact that these people who live in that land have a holy association. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with my very close friend, Faisal Al-Mutar from Ideas Beyond Borders. We're at ARC, the conference. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Great. Let's jump right into it. Let's talk about Enlightenment values. They're under attack. Who's attacking them? Everybody. I think I think Enlightenment is like one of the most attacked principle. Yeah. Um, and I think the authoritarians are... I mean, I think I think of enlightenment as like the antidote of authoritarianism. Yeah, I was I mean, just going to ask you, how do, what do you mean when you say we did an event on this? In yes, our, enlight our Western values worth defending. We changed to enlightenment values worth defending. We'll link to that. Uh, so, what do you mean by enlightenment values? Which is, I mean, to put it simply, for me, is that the individual has rights over the collective. Right. That would mean the right to freedom of speech, the right for freedom of assembly. Is that? You get to born into societies most of the time you never chose. And the social contract is that the individual has rights over the collective. That's how I would define right. the enlightenment. Uh, I mean, that being said, the enlightenment itself is a, is a self-correcting mechanism. And there is critical thinking and debate and conversation is a central focus of it, which makes it, in my opinion, one of the best systems humans ever invented. Because if you look at other systems of thought like organized religion or communism etc they're not self-correcting so they don't evolve with time they don't they don't self-correct at least in a, a quicker rate that i think enlightenment allows it to to um and the, the combination of the fact that to make an argument and to make it universal it has to be based on reason and right, and science 100%. which is which is something and, that and explain why because that is, I think the only thing that is un universal is that when evidence is universal and reason is universal, well, when you go to the kind of the organized religion thing, it becomes my faith says this, your faith says this, and then you can never get in an agreement on what's universally true. While the scientific method, which is a byproduct of the enlightenment, is, is one of the best ways to know what's true. And it's humble. And that's what I also love about it. That it doesn't claim to know the truth. It just gives you the tools to know what is more likely to be true compared to others. Yeah. And we have groups of people who th there's no way to adjudicate between those competing claims without evidence, reason, et cetera. So the enlightenment is under attack. Who's attacking the enlightenment? Well, I mean, I mean, I, I think now there is a very interesting, uh, movement, I would say, which I guess this conference represents, uh, that claimed that the enlightenment has failed or at least is not being, um, really fulfilling. And, and I think there is some truth to that. I think, I think emotionally, the enlightenment is not sexy enough, uh, compared to, a war between good and evil and you gonna go to heaven and the, and the others are gonna go to hell. And, and I think that in a way, like, uh, it, it's, it's not. And I, but however, when we apply the enlightenment, we have reached far more peace globally. I mean, if you look at read Steven Pinker's work from better angels of our nature to enlightenment now, what has created more peace? It's, is the fact that we no longer, at least some of us reduce these concepts of, I am the righteous person and the other people are the, are the bad ones and there is a war between good and evil. Even though, I mean, I grew up with terrorist groups being my neighbors and, and, and I've seen kind of the bad effects when people believe in larger causes and purposeful things like, oh, you are the representative of the good versus the evil. Um, and I, and I think that I agree with that. So I do agree with, with kind of some of the sentiment that enlightenment is not sexy enough. And, and I think many younger people, uh, after we kind of quote unquote reduce the influence of organized religion, um, people are looking for something sexier too. And I think that's part of the rise of people like Jordan Peterson and is that, uh, they are not cocaine. They're more like MDMA. So they're like, right. they, they give you like some of the dose of religion, at, at least 
from a positive outlook, that's how I look at it, is that like Jordan Peterson is like Christianity light, like or, or Islam light. He gives you like small dose, you know, kind of micro dosing. And yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I don't know that it's age appropriate for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> we get demonetized now, yeah. It's banned from YouTube. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I, I think I think yeah, like I, I think part of the rise of of of, uh, of Peterson and others is is that they're micro dosing, is that they give you that and I and I mean you're a philosopher. I mean, is it neat? Needed that you think people are prone that they need to have a purpose in life? Uh, that's a huge question. Um, that's a big question. I think people can make their own meaning and they, they can make their own purpose. And the idea that I think many people who buy into religious traditions have it exactly the opposite. Many people believe, well, if there's no et eternal record keeping of your deeds and of your sins, then life didn't mean anything. And I think that's exactly the opposite. I, I think that because there's no ultimate purpose or ultimate meaning, not just meaning or purpose, that every moment in your life is precious. Every act, every everything is just imbued and just seeping with meaning. And, and I think that's a message worth spreading to like the, I mean, I find that amazingly fulfilling. And I think... It is possible that many people have not heard that story. I think we should, we as people who who are, let's say, fans of the Enlightenment, should also do work to actually make it more appealing to younger generation or uh, to anybody, not just younger generation. I yeah. Think. I, so let me tell you what disturbs me in terms of the context of the conversation. So I went to Battle of Ideas, fun, a lot of people, a lot of friends. I was remar I was struck how remarkably similar to the atheist movement that was. Remarkably similar, similar. There was a kind of deference to authority, a kind of reverence for figures. There wasn't a lot of, at least that I didn't see a lot of debate. People were really talking about in the sessions that I said and ideas that, pe that other people were talking about 10 years ago that, that we were screaming at the rooftops about 10 years ago. I don't know arc. I don't, I haven't quite navigated and figured it out yet, but I would love to see some debate. And I'm not a big fan of I'm a much bigger fan of conversation. So Me too. I'd love to see a conversation. I'd love to see a fireside chat between people who disagree. People have substantive disagreements about the trajectory society should take, how we should live as a people, what constitutes a good life, what are the role that institutions play in just creating disparities or outcomes or how, how you know, what role should freedom play or is this is the state and secularism? I would love to hear a dissenting voice. I didn't hear one at the Battle of Ideas. In fact, in my panel, I argued against the thing that I believe, but I would love to hear that here. And I, I hope, I hope that's here. Yeah. I mean, I mean, funny sometimes to say is that groups that claim to be heterodox are more homogeneous than yeah. <laughs> heterodox. Yeah. Uh, and I think they, they view themselves heterodox, I guess by comparison to the mainstream culture and the coastal elite. I think if you, if you know, like I was talking to a person at the Battle of Ideas and he said, well, traditional values of marrying to a woman and having kids, that's like a, a heterodox idea. I'm like, buddy, that's like the mainstream idea in 90% of the world. Like if you go to Saudi Arabia, do you think they're talking about gay parenting? <laughs> like, right. so the thing is, so I think it's like the, the what is now sometimes being cornered as heterodox ideas is mainly i see it also to some extent as a war between the elites i think it's it's between the conservative elites and the coastal elites and and uh it's it's not so it's really not heterodox when you have no debates when pretty much everybody is agreeing with each other everybody loves their own echo chambers yeah and, and i think that's also another i think a bug of in in the system i think that uh People love to hear confirmation of their own ideas. I think ah, very few people are, are so, comfortable with. So I'm going to push back on that. I think that's a feature of these systems, not a bug. It's a feature of ideas, and and the and I'm in a battle of ideas. I'm incredibly sympathetic, and in fact, I buy it totally. I buy the idea that we can't find people to have a conversation with us. Like I buy the idea. Okay, great. You can't find have people. I'm more than happy to represent the other side. I will, I will, or James Lindsay would be a great person, or Helen Plucker. It's like, I'm more than happy to steal me on the other side. And I do think it's incumbent upon us when people who consider us their ideological enemies, I said this at my panel, and I actually, I genuinely believe this, it's incumbent upon us to make 
better arguments than they could for positions that they hold. If they're not willing to have a conversation with us, there's no other, there's, if anything, if nothing else, it will fuel a positive response to those claims. And I don't, I just don't see that. I, again, I, I can't speak for ARC, but I, I sincerely hope, but yet I also doubt that that's going to be at this conference. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, I mean, I'm more interested in problem solving than interested in, in just ideas alone. I mean, I love to have debates. I love to, in fact, put myself in the other position to see yeah. what, and because that's how we can evolve as societies is through, is through conversation, through the ability to getting feedback to, to your ideas to correct them and or, Sometimes somebody gives you an idea that you never thought about and, and you are like, okay, oops. I'll tell you what I'm sick of. I'm sick of cliches and I'm sick of platitudes. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of what, how do you solve the Israeli-Palestinian problem? Peace and justice. By the way, <laughs> the, I'm sick of it. No, I'm, yeah. I'm just sick of it. it. It's like a refuge for people who are ignorant. I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's just buzzwords. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, uh, this is it definitely is not an answer. And, and that's what I think. When you get to the, to the depth of it, I mean, you have a nonprofit and I do have a nonprofit and then you try to figure out how to actually do it yeah. and how to solve issues. It's very challenging. I mean, there is a lot of logistics involved and, and I don't think that is interesting to a lot of people. I think, I think many people like to just be in the, like, I think what religion gives is that it gives a sense of moral superiority without doing the hard work. And I think there is alternative to what we're kind of seeing. It's kind of similar thing. It's like people want to feel good about themselves and they say these buzzwords and that's how they, yeah. they're they able to sleep at night without having to worry about that's whether right. they publish the 990s tomorrow. And what you said about doing the hard work, you know, I, I was listening to panels where people were saying, well, you don't believe in objective reality. No, it's not. Very few people don't believe in objective reality. And, and they're usually in insane asylums. It's that they think that the power relations are mediated, like the truth is mediated through either a social network or some other power relations. But it's it's too easy to... And I was just so struck by some of the panelists making these claims that just, I shouldn't say no one believes, but virtually nobody believes. And there is a kind of falling in love with one's own virtuous nature in being in this echo chamber and only hearing the, the same positions over and over again. And it just seems to me, I'm old enough now, I'm 57, I've just seen this in movements I've seen this happen over and over again. Yeah. I think it's a function of it just must be something within us. It's it's just a it's a it's a feature not a bug. And coupled with that this kind of weird like reverence and have you know people want heroes and you know Um and also I think uh, there's there's a there's a funny uh, joke that says like uh no one is a virgin reality fucks us all. So yeah. I, I think I think in a way like even if you do not believe in reality, reality forces itself on you. Like yeah. it's something you cannot escape. That's that's what makes it reality. Yeah, yeah. I think the the issue. I mean, to go b bigger than just the movement and conferences. I think that's also like a challenge with the media, right? Is that you need you need marketing and you need to create heroes because that's that's how you maximize sales tickets and yeah. and all of that stuff. So I think it is part. In, like in order for any venue to host something, they the venue will tell them, okay, how many tickets you're gonna sell, and as a result, you have to promote a lot of people for them to be people want to buy tickets to see, and therefore you have to put them in a kind of a reverence, yeah. and and that kind of defeats the purpose because it it makes it really hard uh, to criticize some of those authorities yeah. and and that the whole defeats the purpose of critical thinking and reason, and yeah. because if you create like heroes and, and and angels out of individuals that's what get us into the problems in the first place is that yeah yeah um, yeah and 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 so i think that's something w i mean we can solve if there are people who are interested in supporting the truth at its own on its own and not supporting the kind of the the buzzwords that are associated with it um, yeah and i i wonder because i've been been pretty down about the general conditions of things i just talked to to, to our mutual friend Dave Rubin about this, I've just been pretty bearish on this, the, certainly the geopolitical situation, but also internal to the United States. And everybody likes a positive message. It's, everybody likes to, but I'm just, I'm not seeing it. I'm just, I'm just not seeing it. 
it, it's difficult. Um, I mean, the only positive message I have really, which is again sounds very counterintuitive, is that we are still living in one of the safest centuries on the planet and, and since the human existence. I mean, if you compare us to 20th century and the 19th century, where True. or the 33 years war where people are are burning each other in Europe. I mean, I mean, yeah. now we're in England, right? Like, That's the better angels of our nation. Yeah, I mean, and, and there was a time, I guess, what, 60 years ago, where the, the planes from Germany were bombing the hell out of London. Yeah. And now you can grab a $20, $20 flight from yeah, Berlin yeah, yeah. to London. Uh, I mean, that, that's, I think, the only things that gives me hope is that, like, there was a time when, like, world wars were killing tens of millions of people. And now many conflicts at their extreme are killing much less than a million people. Um, so is it, isn't that, though, I do believe the moral arc is bending toward, toward no, justice. No, I don't think. I think I don't think it's bending toward justice. I think is that we are slightly. I think it's because of people fighting for it. I don't think it just happens. No, I agree. I don't believe in destiny. I don't believe. I, th I think you, you think have to fight. And that's the reason I'm working. And that's so you're working. I think both of us are not believers of destiny. I think. Yeah. Do Do you think many of the people in the United States believe that there are? And I guess we have to define many, but. Do you think a significant portion of young people in the United States understand civics, understand social responsibility, not social justice, but do you think they understand why enlightenment values matter? Do you think they understand why freedom matters? Do you, do you no. Think, you know, the answer I, is no. Uh, and I don't, I mean, you are in the solutions business onto this one, but from my just understanding of human nature is that unless they suffer the consequences of not having those value, the, not having the freedoms, and it will they will not it will not come to them. I'm mean, seeing now because of the whole Israel Palestine subjects that many people on the left are complaining about cancel culture because some of their uh, protests are being canceled in universities and things like that. And it's like we have been talking about this the whole time. Right. For ten years, that when you cancel people, you censor people, it's gonna come to you. Right. And the same right that you are using is now being used against you. So now I think so that that's that's unfortunately like is that we have been warning them, we have been telling them this is gonna happen, we're gonna be telling them that censorship leads to more censorship. They never listened until it came to them. So I think hopefully I saw now businesses, I guess a couple of students messaging me. So some of the businesses are not hiring people who have signed declarations blaming Israel for the attack, which was mainly the Harvard, the Harvard events. Um, and many of the students start running away from the signatures. They're like, I didn't sign this. I, I swear I didn't sign this. It was just a WhatsApp group. I said yes to, etc. But when they saw like the billionaires, who many of them support Israel, so like we're not going to hire them. Uh, so now their beliefs start having consequences. Right. And it's, so slimy. It's so slimy. And it's so cowardice. Um, yeah. So unbased. It's so unprincipled. It's so degenerate. It is so degenerate. I mean, and and that I think really shows what it is. I mean, the fact that oh, like what is the the term the champagne socialist is that exactly. And and I find that like to, I find these people to be like the worst. Even though I like to focus on ideas, not on people. Yeah. But those who hold the moral high ground and. They have the luxury of these beliefs, and the the moment these their beliefs get uncomfortable, is the moment they run away, which also gives me hope. Like there's the fact that like, I mean, it's one thing to deal with kind of radical jihadists who some of them believe in in concept of heaven and hell, compared to like some of these just cowards who wanted to feel good about themselves and 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 say these buzzwords for them to to feel moral or superior and look moral or superior compared to others. But the moment their beliefs are tested and they're like, okay, you're, you went to Harvard, but you're not going to get that job at Wall Street or you're not going to get a job. At There's something, and believe me, I'm the last person in the world to support a jihadist. There is something about somebody having integrity in their beliefs. There is something about somebody being honest with you, even if you find their beliefs odious. Like, I mean, just the thought of being friends with somebody who has, is so capricious with their beliefs, so subject to the vagaries of the age, like, oh, now this is in vogue, I'm going to believe this, now that, I just, I think that's a horrible basis for friendship. 
I, I just, I not a basis of friendship, but I personally don't think I could be friends with someone like that. Someone who who keeps switching their beliefs to whatever is convenient. Yeah, you you we we talked about this last time you you were in London. They sw either they switch their beliefs to something that's convenient, or they because I've been thinking a lot about friendship lately and how. Have like, you lost many friends lately? Do you yeah, think? many many friends. Well, well yeah, you're never gonna lose me for good, sure. Thanks, brother. Appreciate. I really appreciate that. And if we did have a disagreement, we'd just work it out. We'd talk talk yeah. about it. yeah. So I appreciate that. And yeah, it's been painful for me, man. It's 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 really sucked. Um, but universally, the cause has been that those people have fallen. It, the cause is that it they got the mind virus. Like that's yeah. why they got the mind virus. And people who pride themselves on conversation too. That's the crazy thing to me. Well, that makes it more crazy, I guess. Um, but it, I mean, that, that's and and it's pretty pretty uh, when like when. He, I, I guess that could always be a red flag of an ideology. When the ideology is telling you to dissociate from your friends, exactly. that's when you know it's a cult. Right. Like, I, I've studied cults mainly in the Middle East. There's a very famous one called MEK, which is based in Iran. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And part of the association when you join MEK, you have to kind of say that you will fight for the cause over sex. And that is that you're not going to sleep with your wife if, if you are in this position of, of, of fighting or you have to associate with your, from your parents. If your parents object to you joining the group. And it's like, if, if this is the conditions of you joining this, right. run away. Like, <laughs> right. so, so, so like it, it, it is a mind virus. Like I think people need, I, I guess it's like when people reach a level in which I am dissociating with my close friend or, yeah. you know, you are in a cult. And I think what is interesting about kind of the more, I guess you would call it the woke, woke cult is that it doesn't have a clear leader. It, it's not, it's, so you cannot just say like, oh, don't follow this guy. Even though there are icons, right? The, the one, um, who's the one in the Boston University who had the center, the anti-racism oh, center. Uh, Ibram X. Kendi. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he's definitely an icon and a beneficiary of, of that. Um, what a completely pretentious charlatan. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been screaming about his, bogus idiotic work stamped from being all this i've been screaming about this so many smart people were hoodwinked by that so many so it's amazing how many otherwise thoughtful people were fell prey to this total charlatan i think and that is again that's i would say one of the scariest things like is that the fact even those who i guess are reasonable for about a lot of things suddenly suspend all critical thinking skills and that's what always scares me I mean, okay I let me tell you what scares me and you asked me about being hopeful for the future what scares me is that these values are being promulgated by our institutions these values the people who occupy positions of power in media particularly the university legacy media they discharge these mind virus impulses in the way they do their job and their reporting, everything, the little things like the difference between a protest and a riot. And they're clearly riots, clearly destroying businesses, clearly assaulting, clearly by any definition, it is not, a, it is a riot. And yet they continue in the, in, in the mainstream media. I'm thinking about the Oregon, um, yeah. in Oregon using the word protest instead of riot. I'm, I'm concerned that the, capture of our institutions is so complete and so totalizing i just don't see a way back I, I just don't see and one thing for sure i don't see is punishing these people i don't and i'm not necessarily saying they should be punished i've predicted repeatedly that the same people who were screaming at the roof about this calling everybody nazis like you said uh calling everybody fascists or whatever the same people who were doing medical experiments on children the same people who have led kind of uh, you know assaulted gone after people at work diversity boards etc once this ideology falls into ill repute once this ideology is permanent to borrow a phrase from bob, bob marley permanently incredited uh, 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 abandoned uh, they will be well uh w once that happens they will gaslight i never believed it i never believed it i never believed it and there's overwhelming evidence nobody's it's so monstrously idiotic and i, I was saying every authoritarian ideology has loopholes and and i think 
they, the, I guess one of the benefits of authoritarian, authoritarian ideologies is that they're also self-defeating. Yeah. Which I think that also, like, at the beginning is that you start with, like, uh, Black Lives Matter or Trans Lives Matter, which I think in principle is something I support. But then eventually it's, you have to su not only support a Black Lives Matter, you have to support a Somali trans pirate, and that is the only right. person who can <laughs> right. speak right. on the subject of race. Right. So, I, so eventually, nobody else is going to be able to speak on the subject of race because only the Somali trans pirate can do it. Right. And, and there's only five of them. So, so, <laughs> so I think, <laughs> I think that what is that this ideology is by default self-destructive. Yeah. My only fear is that the rate of destruction is that higher than the rate of construction. That's that's exactly my fear. The way that uh, it rips down our institutions. So if 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 it's a complete, um, I mean, you you are of the school that thinks that like the takeover has already been done, right? Like it's, it's totally done. Uh, I know it's done. Yeah, and you you are an, you are an insider. You you were part of the yeah. Um, and but I see. I mean, I I think now also. I mean. Again, I'm trying to be optimistic. That's always my. Is that also there are a lot of ways to gain education these days that were not. So, like, we, we used to think that, I mean, before it was like, if you don't go to university, there's no way you can get things. Yeah. Uh, now it's not that straight, clear, clear forward, unless it's like something important like medical school or lawyer. Yeah, I told my daughter to be an electrician. Which is, I mean, if many people, I mean, many people go to college because they want to get a degree to get a job. And the thing is, like, now there's a lot of trade jobs and technical jobs that, so people, why and, and and the fact that the universities i found the fact that people spend two hundred thousand dollars to study this it's i mean just buy 7-eleven like that that's it's much totally easier crazy. to to actually manage than so so i i think that's what uh what as systems like n universities are not profitable i mean when you go to ideologies that are by default destructive right so you, how are you going to maintain right. Unless, unless eventually, like control the tax code, and so then they're, eventually they're, they're no longer interested in what's true. By and large, I mean in the STEM fields, it's the last holdout. But the the goal is to replicate that dominant ideology, and and I think that God, just think of the massive betrayal of students. Think I know of the massive betrayal of public trust. I mean, think of think of think of just even think about it. You got the individual level, how we've screwed the students over. We've got the level of to have a functioning civil society, democracy, you need an educated citizenry. We've failed people miserably on that. I mean, it's been, again, to borrow Florence Reed from Unheard's, we are living in a time that is uniquely stupid. This is uniquely stupid, and it is so obvious to us. So that's the thing that frustrates me about this conference. Like, I've been screaming about this stuff since 2015. Where, where's everybody been? Now we have a big conference. All Where have people been? Where have they been? Where have they been when they're when they're railroading and screwing people all over the place? Where have these people been? They, are they now just all of a sudden just jumping on the bandwagon for this stuff? I think I think for a large part, uh, yes. And I, and I think is that again back to convenience. Back in the day, you were like leading the like, but mostly by yourself. Um, and I, many people like I would consider you one of the founding fathers of the whole movement uh, but many people jump on things when they're convenient unfortunately and, now, and it came to them i right. mean it, it started either, affecting it, them it, right it either comes to them so they'll speak up oh believe all women okay well maybe not all women defund the police okay well maybe that was in real a monstrously stupid idea but it's now easy for these people to gather in a room at arc and say oh yeah well or battle of ideas should we teach critical social justice or critical theory in schools like <laughs> like you yeah, it's easy to say that now. Where were you? Where were you? And they and that's the other thing is they haven't done the homework, so they get the basic principles wrong. So they don't even know the things they're criticizing. Yeah, it's just so frust. It's like an ex a mass exercise in frustration, and then everybody creates their own echo chamber, and and they're. I, I just I don't know. Well, it's I'm I'm very excited to attend your first conference. I think you should organize. <laughs> I should. I think you should you should do a Peter Bogosian conference. No, no. I'm, there's no conferences. That, look, I, if I were to do one, I'm not going to do one. But they would only there'd be no panels, there'd be no lectures, there'd be no talks. There'd only be a series of debates and fireside chats with people who not just because they wrote a book, um, you know. I, but I'm not I'm not I'm not going to do that. But but my level of frustration is high. People haven't listened. 
people are jumping on the bandwagon. People don't have precision in their criticisms. So they're criticizing things that they think people believe, but they don't actually believe. They're doing it now because it's convenient and it's easy and they found a tribe. But that doesn't show integrity. It doesn't show a spine. It doesn't show a kind of moral fiber. It's just very, the whole thing is just very frustrating to me. And then, and then we splinter off and we create other echo chambers. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think one of my favorite conferences in the world, I, I forgot the name, but, but it was, is like they, they bring in a lot of people who, with like, within the international development phase and they give us a challenge yeah. and each one of them, there is the philosopher and there's the international developer person and there is the logistical person. All of them work together to solve a problem. Yeah. And I love that. It was like very straightforward. It makes people work together and it activates that part of the brain about identifying solutions yeah, and yeah, trying yeah. to, um, and, and to, to add to what you're saying is like, number one, they're mostly late to the subject. I mean, what we're, we're what we're seeing now with arcs so are like, there were times in which the intervention was actually far more important in 2015 yeah, and 16. And, and it was more difficult. It was more Now it's very easy. And where, 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 where were you when it was difficult? Where were you when the, you had to pay a price? Where were you when something is at stake? Oh, you're silent. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, I don't want to. Now, all of a sudden, when it's convenient and easy, everybody gets together for the conference and then now they're up, you know. And, and then because they have a miss, like kind of, they miss the time in which they, or they misidentified the problem, the solutions they bring to the table are also mostly authoritarian too. Like, I mean, there were a lot of attempts to like ban this and ban that and, and then create the more strong reaction. So like, so you have half ass understanding with half ass solutions. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's only going to make things worse. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes I am m more against, like I'm against half ass solutions because they backfire more than sometimes not having any solution at all. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think, how, however, I mean, is it good that there is now a lot of people, I guess, awakened for the lack of a better word, <laughs> um, uh, against the, the, the totalitarian woke ideology? I guess. Well, yeah, unless they, unless they themselves are kind of uh, totalitarianism, unless they, which unless is the, common. yeah, unless the axis that the, the, the propositions they're espousing are anti authoritarian or anti enlightenment, unless they want to create a kind of secular blasphemy where whatever issue of the day they don't want talked about or they don't want dissent view viewed. And I see that as an inevitable trajectory. Again, I, I can't speak. For yeah, this I, I mean, I mean, I've heard actually some of the, I think it's a battle of ideas. One of the people told me that they want to ban critical race theory, but they also want to teach the Bible in schools. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, that's one one way of yeah, solving. Yeah, so things. that's exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Yeah, so I was like, and and so so in a way, it's like you're just replacing one. Right. <laughs> you're just replacing one idea with another. So like you're still forcing people to. Well, I I just as I saw you as I pulled you in here, I had mentioned someone that I moved out of Portland is one of the best decisions I've ever made, and some guys like, well, you know, go to. Ida Reed was there. Go go to Idaho. You know, there's, you know, no money for abortion, and they have all this stuff and this. And he's like listing off these talking points. Some of some of which were quite authoritarian. And I'm like, wow, you you like you just you just don't see it. Like it's a an, another kind of tribalism that uses the same enforcement mechanisms, and then you create these ideological bubbles as opposed to saying, okay, well, what's the reason? What's the evidence? Let's take a look at it. How do you know it? Let's have a kind of a conversation, maybe if you don't, if one doesn't like the word conversation or argument map, whatever you, you whatever you want to say, but I'm con I'm concerned. I, I share your concern. I mean, I, I I don't believe in solving authoritarianism with another one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what's the point? Yeah. Uh, even even if if I mean, somebody might argue is that, which I've heard some people even within our movement, some of them with our our friends, would say. Well, I mean, they are authoritarian, but not as bad. Like, I'm, I'm right. willing to side right. with. Right. I'm willing to side with the group with the person who bans Harry Potter in school. Right. Because he's a lesser evil than the person who wants to teach critical theory. Right. theory so, I, I still, I would say, have been bought that argument because I think, not to make both sidism, but it's like when r reason and 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 critical thinking are not the ones being promoted. I am not a fan. In default, and 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 the thing is, like, to be kind of forced, like, again, I I still have some idealistic side in me that that believes that humans are actually not that dumb. <laughs> 
I think I think I think I mean my whole organization is based yeah. on the concept that if we make these tools available, yeah. critical thinking and 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 enlightenment values available and make them accessible um in lang- different languages and in different different approaches, I don't think that the majority of people so like this idea is that kind of parental approaches yeah. or to please the critical race theory with the Bible or or all of that. Um I I uh, and in fact why not just touch people critical thinking and let them choose whether they want to choose the Bible or or critical race theory or find what's right there and what's wrong there. All this stuff would disappear almost overnight. Exactly. So so I think I think some people seem to have given up on the concept that which I think is is a sad story on its own is is that they have given up on the concept of the enlightenment altogether and now we actually have to pick a side. I agree. Um, or even worse than given up they they were taught to just a priori right from the get-go discard it because it's racist it it seeks to you know reify or support existing power structures or which white, was the thing we had in portland right and correct in our panel when somebody right. showed up at the end who i don't think attended enough of the speech and she I said know. that in the enlightenment values is the cause of slavery i'm right. like have you heard of slavery <laughs> outside of the western world or actually <laughs> right. that's right <laughs> i mean the last but country- that's what they're teaching yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and and they even said she she didn't attend any of, but she just heard that enlightenment equals slavery, right. um, which right. is uh, the complete opposite. But but yeah, I mean, I, I I say, I think we have to push our. I think I think your work is very important. I think yeah. but I think we we have to give it our best shot. Uh, and see what happens. Well, what, I mean, there, there's no other alternative. There's no other there's, alternative. Enlightenment values are worth fighting for. Reason is worth fighting for. Rationality is worth fighting for. It's worth fighting to live in a free society in which people have cognitive liberty. And yeah, there will be authoritarian forces on the right and the left and some other access that we probably can't even imagine right now for some other set of beliefs that we can't imagine. But we we know we know the answers to the problem in terms of structures of systems enlightenment values we know how that can manifest in many not every policy decision but we we know the answers we don't need to let's see if there is a reason for optimism is because very smart people far smarter than i and you frankly have already done the work for us yeah so yeah. we've we we have inherited this incredibly rich tapestry this tradition we know that these values are timeless we know that they're rationally derivable and we know they work and, and uh, we know they work yes and 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 whatever they are applied everywhere and and, and uh, the data also like and and to be honest, i mean i lived under authoritarianism it's not right. that fun and to give you like one story which i which i learned is that i mean it's always a big question about how did the ottoman empire f- fall and one of the reasons actually i verified was one of the um the sultans believe in astrology oh. and he decided to go to a war when the astrologer told him like this is the best month to go to a war and then he got his ass kicked so imagine like i mean the, the story is funny because it actually that what happens when policy is based on astrology yeah not based on reason right you can have the, your whole entire country destroyed or losing uh, tens of thousands of people because your leader believes in superstitious bullshit. Right. So, so like, I don't. Reagan had astrologers in the White House, and, and that's scary. A White House astrologer. I mean, I mean, to be honest, that's scary, especially when you have a country with nuclear weapons. I mean, right. I mean, it is. It so so we know like the consequences of the non-rational beliefs. Right. Are actually pretty high, and the history is filled with destruction and deaths and and all of that because a lot of it is rational. Does that mean that oh, like we have the right answers? No, we don't. But the, but the whole great thing about the Enlightenment is the self-correcting piece, is exactly. the open debate, is the fact that w- uh, when we talk about about each we talk to each other, we don't invoke a higher authority that nobody can dispute or even talk to. Right. So eventually, like. And the argument on its own can survive not having to utilize gods or, or any. Uh, so I, I think, yeah. and, and I, would, and I guess like to I guess then, I guess was it the declaration of independence is that, I mean, these values are self-evident. And I think that's what we have in our side. We still need to work better on making it more um, accessible and more, I guess, sexy. Um, because I, I listen, I've listened to like Peterson, I've listened to many of these people 
sometimes I actually don't know what they're talking about. Like sometimes like it, the conversation goes for four hours and I ended up more confused after watching Thinking it for hours. someone that I have no idea what he's talking about 99% of the time. But. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, but I see like the appeal and I attended a couple of his events in, in the Beacon Theater. Oh, Peterson, I think, I think Peterson's super clear. You super, think so? Yeah, I do. I think he's super clear. I Maybe think I'm, I'm the stupid one then. No, I'm, well, I guess a lot of this stuff I've, I've, have a passing familiarity with so i think that makes it e yeah. easier I, I i was a psychology major i read psychology i don't read psychology books but i i like i'm a big fan I, I read articles all the time i love reading articles but um one of the things i want to say that i think is so unbelievably important that you do like i'm not bsing like nobel prize winning important like i legit believe this is the translation of enlightenment texts into arabic I mean, and one of them is, was your book, How to Have a Possible Conversation. Was it really? Yeah. You just told me that right now. Wow. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. I think that we are – here, I'll offer a solution. I think that we're short on listening. I think that like if on a personal level, when I look at my own life and mistakes I've made, relationships that I've had that haven't gone well, or I think I haven't listened enough to what – people want and i think if i were more open to trying to understand their point of view i personally would have benefited from that and i think as a society that's also the case we face somewhat of an intractable problem in that the people we want to bring to the adult table to have conversations like this about things that matter, like trans issues, for example, whether or not how much that matters, we, we can have that conversation. But these people simply will not have the conversation. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to come back to my original claim. Then it's incumbent upon us to make their arguments for them better than they could have made. And it's incumbent upon conferences like this to bring in people like James Lindsay would be the perfect person. He would be the perfect person for that. His Oxford... Uh, debate he did that but i would have done it with more um you know for for has wokeness gone far enough he argued wokeness can't go too far it leads to the ruination of society and that's good but without that uh, facetious uh, nature at at the end and one of the things i see happening is that we are not only creating echo chambers we're, we're experiencing this in mass yeah like the whole society is experiencing this and uh, you you see it also with 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 the fundraising and the foundations and stuff like that is like oh i've seen you receive money from this organization that we think is right. bigoted or too libertarian or, you talk to, or even offense by proxy oh you talk to this guy yeah yeah i i've got that a lot over the, over the, over the past even though i would say our work has been hardly can be described as political in terms of however it's like oh we've seen you yeah. taking a picture with this person and we've seen so that's the other thing i want to mention to you the thing that i find also s stupid although not uniquely stupid about this is that people frame things in terms of right left i don't understand like why would you even think about that like what is the evidence if the evidence is good and trump happens to believe it then that's good. Then we should do it. Or Biden or whoever it is. And that's another thing. Don't get me started on the, the fact that we've picked those two guys out of the whole yeah, yeah. country. By the Don't way, that was my first so election my as a U.S. citizen. God. So I became a citizen in 2019. And my first election as an American was picking between Trump and Biden. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I'm truly really sorry. <laughs> that was not really sorry the, about that. The most fun experience. But, uh, but, it, but it is frustrating to me to hear these things framed in terms of not in terms of evidence and reason, but in terms of, oh, you know, this broadly, com they won't say this, but this broadly comports with our ideological stance. That's just, I don't, there's something about that. I, I mean, just why would you think that your whole ideology is correct? That's the other crazy. It's, it's tribalism. I it mean, is total tribal. It's, it's that people want to belong more than they want to be right. Yes. They want to signal. They want to. And, and, uh, I've, I've seen it. I mean, Again, I grew up in a civil war. I, yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah. people lose their rationality or to the extreme. Like it, there were kids who used to play soccer together. As uh, suddenly the civil war broke off, and then the rule of law was destroyed. And then, yeah, yeah. oh, you are Sunni, you are Shia, you are Kurd, you are this, you are Christian, and everybody went. I guess what people call the primary identity, which yeah, is like yeah, yeah. the most uh, basic of the basic, and 
um yeah. and it's it's scary to watch um i mean it's, it's scary it's scary to watch in real time but it's also scary to watch it in more freer societies like america yeah, yeah, yeah. where people actually have a choice not to be tribal yeah. and that's actually what i think more but at least like in a civil war you have to kind of pick a side yeah. because your survival is dependent on it yeah. um but here i mean the whole purpose of defending the west i guess are allowed is that you don't actually have to pick a side you can you can actually amazing isn't it yeah and people still choose to pick a side yeah uh and, and choose it kind of like sometimes defend it religiously as if it's like it's their local football team yeah and i was like actually you don't have to pick between right and the left and there are you can pick whatever ideas that uh, whatever you are and that's i think a conversation worth having is like is your values based on Utilitarian principles of yeah, maximizing yeah. human, and, or and you that's know, a conversation worth having, not like yeah, left right bullshit. Yeah, hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. I used to always, always, always tell my students, if you don't like it, run for office. <laughs> Start small. Start with a local office. Start with a local office. Work your way up. Be the change you want to see. Be, you know, I, 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 I think. Okay, let, let let me pause. Can I change gears on you real quick? Of and course. Ask, ask you a quick question. So we, we were hanging out with, uh, uh, we were recently hanging out with Winston and Coleman and Constantine, and you guys had a, uh, talk about the Israeli Palestinian situation. I couldn't be in the room because I despise cigarette smoking. Yeah, I don't blame you. I just couldn't take it. It was killing me. Yeah, that's, that's a very health decision, actually. Yeah, well, I just hate it so much. I couldn't even breathe. But, so I had to laugh. So it was nothing personal, but how the, fuck are we going to get our, our way out of this problem um i don't think we will oh, well uh, that's not the answer i'm looking <laughs> for but I, I, i'm I glad think, you're honest I mean, um i i think i think admitting that could also part of the solution because uh that like every side like i know again it's like i always get accused of both sidism even though like even though I, proportionally i i i, I um I side to one side over the other is that I mean here is the I is my my story of why it happened. Yeah. Um Saudi Arabia was kind of getting closer to Israel and Saudi Arabia has the two holiest sites of Islam, Mecca and Medina and Jerusalem has the third one. Right. And uh what happened really at its core was Iran vetoing that and saying we're going to stir the whole shit up inside the Middle East so in that way we're going to see the Israelis killing more Muslims and therefore more Muslims will side with us as Iran over the Jews. That's a simple, that's what the conflict is about. Right. It started inflamed and most intel, intel suggests that that's the geopolitical game. Right. So, however, so that's like if you are zooming out big picture, that's what happened. And the more rational response is not to take debate and try to actually advance peace more than trying to, to play on the, on the emotions. However, because the attack was so emotionally like strong like we are seeing women being raped we're seeing people getting kidnapped in front of our eyes as what happened on october 7th then israel emotionally cannot not respond in in a more very uh, kind of violent way um so it's really like a catch-22 to some extent and i think that it's uh i mean i am affected i mean one of the translators of neil degrasse tyson was killed yeah, by an israeli yeah. airstrike who she she lives in gaza she's like a a young woman just translating science books and stuff like that um and we had to like kind of reach out to our family and and, and let so her know sorry. so i'm i'm dealing with this on a personal and a professional level and almost like many of the people who are getting killed have nothing to do with the whole thing right like the, the civilians and and they are like the um, but however, because this land again has such a, uh, I don't know. Have you been to Israel yourself? No, I have. Um, I'm especially not going to go Reed and I are not going right now. I can assure you. So like the, the, I've never understood it. And I think I, I get the, I have the luxury of, of kind of grew up kind of secular in which I don't look at any ho land as being ho holy in any shape or form, but you do have tens of millions, I mean, actually hundreds of millions of people who believe this piece of land is like 
the, the land of God. I completely, yep. 100%. And that itself is a non conversation starter. Well, read, because, read, I just um, want to interrupt real quick. So, Reed and I have been asking people this question. We do the, you know, the street epistemology where we go around the world and ask people this. We've been asking people, is this conflict about religion? And I am flabbergasted. I am flabbergasted by how many people say religion has either absolutely nothing to do with it, almost, nothing, but it's so obviously religion plays some role. Of course, yeah. I mean, you know, when you ask the socialists is... or the communists, they're like, no, it's all about capital. Like, all of it? Yep, all of it. We have videos, <laughs> and we have it on video. They're like, all, like, all of it? Really? Like, a hundred percent of it? Yep, a hundred percent of it. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I mean that's, uh, here is the thing, because, because, again, you're not going to expect religious people to also be not contradictory, because they contradict themselves all the time. Um, it is, I mean, if you look at the protests right now, right? Uh, there are people being killed all across the Middle East in so many different countries. I mean, there's now a civil war in Sudan, right. killing tens of thousands Correct. of people. There's why would why you don't see a protest in London about people killed in Sudan or about the Uyghurs or about the Uyghurs? Their actual concentration because from... because their land is not holy. It's simple as that. Yeah, yeah. It's not like that people uh, like necessarily think is that the land where this cup where this battle is happening holds more value it's kind of like when wisconsin electoral college has 18, i guess eight times the votes of people living in new york right. it's kind of the same thing is that many people are selective about which human rights care they care about or which people they care about based on, on the fact that these people who live in that land have a holy association otherwise you would see two hundred thousand people protesting in london against the uyghurs or you see them or, or so so anybody who kind of dissociates that um from i mean are there i mean the interesting thing with with kind of the conflict is that there were a combination of religious and nationalistic movements in the arab world against israel so both i mean one of the first people who invaded israel was nasser who was the president of egypt and he was anti not anti-religion but but he was a secular leader so so in a way from the arab nationalists you could have arab nationalists who oppose israel purely on a kind of that this is arab land and they have taken the arab land or you can have the religious people from pakistan who are like Oh, this land is our land as well because we are Muslims and and the Aqsa Mosque is is there. Right. So I th I think is that it makes it, and 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 then you have kind of settlers in in West Bank believe that the West Bank is part of Judea and Samaria and and that's the how the Messiah is going to come back. So if this is kind of the starter of their conversation, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and th there is like yeah, it's kind of like there is a massive. I don't know. Giraffe is, is sinking in in the ocean, and you have to like get it out. And and, and it, it's 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 uh it's not impossible, but it is I think the closest it is to impossible because reason gets thrown all over. Like, how can you reason between two groups who say this land is holy to us? And yeah. I think is that so you you're not uh, so. Okay, so one of the things that we've learned when we've asked people with justice is that they mean something, they traffic in a very different notion of justice. For them, justice is kind of something retributive, punish, punishing. You know, punish the, the uh, they won't say the Israelis, some will, but they'll say the Jews. Punish the Jews for, and again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm explicitly, I'm not siding, I'm just telling you what they've told me. Yeah, yeah. Because I've tried to understand what they mean when they say just like i genuinely am interested in what they believe like i'm actually interested in that. yeah when you so, do a good job in, oh in thanks, to figure, thanks. Out, figure out the, the rules. I, I appreciate that because unless you figure out what someone believes it's almost impossible to figure out how what how to solve it i love that yeah yeah so w what they mean by justice is some kind of weird equity like some kind of like we've been p punished and now we must punish and then we have in, but the, but that's not evident when you just hear the word justice. Like you, I, like I don't, when I think of justice, I don't think of like any kind of retru retribution. Like I, I, for past sins in particular. Okay. So bracketing that, what do we do about this? Is it, 
excuse me, is it a two state solution? Is it what do we how do we move forward in any meaningful way? Because you know, one of the things that you said when I won't name the person's name, but they said, well, you know, we, we have to answer for this. And you're like, well, what happened? What if it happens in the West Bank? And they're like, well, we need to answer to that. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. And, and then and you said, like, and then he, and this person said, this individual said, well, every time that, it, and you said, well, what about Lebanon? And, 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 and you said something like, he's like, this is what we must do. And then you said, well, this is a hypothesis we're going to test. Let's see how the, we're about to test this hypothesis. Let's see how that works out. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and we're going to see that. And I think, um, unfortunately, that's what it's very likely to happen. Is I mean, this that, could not possibly end well. I mean, no. not, not, po no, in uh, no possible way could the murder of, and I think there's going to be murders on both sides. Murders. And, and what, what I think is, uh, is that the, let's start with, again with the beginning of the story that the perpetrator which is iran iran believes i mean just i i think it's very important this says so the term ayatollah means you are the representative of the 12th imam right. aka the messiah until right. the messiah comes back so this is how messiah and there is this quote which i think is verified and i and i took, took further and i wrote in farsi it's kind of crazy quote that said if Iran gets nuclear weapons and they attack Israel, and there are six million Jews go, uh, six million Jews get killed, and fifty million Iranians get killed, the fifty millions will go to heaven, and the six million will go to hell. Right. That is, a, that is, I think, a quote from the leader of Iran. Right. So when you have people in the fight who have this messianic kind of complex mindset and yeah. mindsets, uh, it's never going to end well. That that that, that that's the, the unfortunate part. part. Um, and and the thing is that the two state solution. Um, what I at least I know about the conflict. It is what people who are outside of the conflict think that the solution is. That's because, me. That's me. Because they see it more through like rational kind of yeah, that's aerial me. way of looking at the at the world and zoom out. Yeah, yeah. and it's like okay. There's this piece of land. Yeah. Why not these guys take this and why not these guys take this? Because in a way, it makes total sense. However, the people who, like, I, I was, I met with this person from uh, from Long Island, and he's a settler in in the West Bank, so he's, he's on Jewish side, and he said, "What what two state solution? Like, fuck that. Uh, this is Judea and Samaria is part of our." holy land and we and we need to take it back because how the hell the messiah is going to come back if if we're not going to take off the west bank so I'm, I'm not saying that's a representation of, yeah. of of israel but definitely a representation of, of of some of the people there and and then i mean the people that i have seen the most advocating for the solution within the conflict are mostly secular jews who live in tel aviv yeah and these are people who are like used to diversity they are there because most of them have been born there they have strong identity that is israeli but at the same time they are kind of look at the world through a humanistic lens not through necessarily a very tribal lens um and then you have the other challenge i mean i mean the the palestinians and unfortunately it's, it's a fact that the majority of arabs do not support this two-state solution right that many of them I read that. still yeah, yeah. have the yeah. delusion that they can defeat and wipe out Israel. And that has been going on since 1948, and they have tried in 1948, 1967, and that kind of belief from what they call from the river to the sea, right. Palestine will be free. Yeah, what, what do you think mean that they mean by that? They, I mean, they mean that Palestine will go back to its, its kind of what people thought Palestine right. was. So what do you think that means for the inhabitants of Israel? Um, as that, we, we, Reed and I heard that chant like, yeah, th what a thousand times read at um, least a thousand times the protests when, when we were to, to give you one of the people that I believe not Joe Rogan Lex Friedman interviewed his name Muhammad al Kurd, uh, and he asked him kind of similar question and Muhammad al Kurd is like an icon for like guess the New York Times and and he was like interviewed as one of like the the Palestinian activists and his answer was well this is a second thought let's let's get rid of israel kind of and then we'll see what happens later that, that is not what well, we haven't thought of the afterwards uh that is like i guess the most clear answer that we have gotten from one of the, like the leading activists which is like maybe we'll figure out when that happens um 
Interesting. And I, I guess that doesn't make people who live in Israel feel comfortable when when there is a, <laughs> when there is a, a yeah. group of people who will tell you like, well, we, we're gonna destroy the state and we will take care of it when we do. Um, yeah. and, and and that also creates again a reaction from the Israeli population for them to go further on their attack. So so it's like it is a constant cycle. Um, and I when we started Ideas Beyond Borders. Our first kind of decision was not to be involved in the conflict, and that was uh, mainly. I mean, I, I, as a person, I don't like to pick up battles that I know I will lose. And yeah. it, it is it's one thing to talk, and that's what I find even interesting about the Middle East is that, and I've seen it in the past t- two weeks. Many of the atheists in the Middle East, say like, when I, let's say, let's bring Sam Harris solutions when he was talking about the Middle East, about, oh, the solution to kind of radical Islam is to make everybody an atheist. Let's take that, the new atheist perspective. Many of the atheists I know are also opposed Israel. So, so yes, you can, you can reduce the hatred to Israel by kind of reducing religious fervor. Yeah, but yeah. the issue, like I have seen, like, uh, women educators all the way to scientists to so so now however th- that's i think is is that i mean you can have people who can accept other values of the enlightenment i guess you can they can accept a free enterprise they can accept lower taxation but on this subject that's one of the things that um there is no like you can find very few who will kind of be i guess pro israel i mean it's been very hard to find even people who condemn Hamas from, like, if they would condemn Hamas, they will say it kind of like, I support a free speech, but kind of the equivalent yeah, is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't, I condemn what they did, but it's, right. and that's, and that's, I think, what is important when you kind of ask the questions, because there was like, like a Gallup poll about 9 11. I think it happened like in, in the early 2000s. And, they asked the question, do you support 9-11? And most people are like, no, of course not. We don't support 9-11. I think it was in, in Jordan or Egypt. And then they said, do you think that killing the civilians in, in the name of self-defense is justified? And the majority of people said yes. <laughs> so then after the, the follow-up question was, and kind of they rephrased it, do you think that 9-11 was justified as a self-defense against the U.S. occupation of Muslim lands? And that's when a lot of people start saying yes. Interesting. So the thing is, like, you really have to dig further than you tell people, oh, do you support Hamas or do you condemn Hamas? Yeah. Because you really don't get a clear answer. Like, only very few will say, yes, I condemn Hamas, and then they stop. Like, or I condemn the attack and they stop. They're always going to be like, I, I don't think that's what was good, but this, this, but that is kind of a response to the to the continuous years of occupation of 70 years and things like that. And that's what Piers Morgan, that's where the guy that they had, yeah. multiple people that they had, one of them is a person I debated, who was Basim Yusuf. Um, and he, I mean, he, he f- became popular in the Arab world for trying not to, like, to, to condemn the West and condemn the West support for Israel. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a very, uh, I mean, I, th- I think that it's one of those conflicts that I don't think that uh, both sides are willing to negotiate. And, and the All more right. that kill people dead, the less people are willing to negotiate. All right, listen, we need to wrap it up. I just want to say a few things. You know, I've said repeatedly, it seems to be the lowest of low-hanging fruit that universities in particular where, where Jews, not Zionists or anything, pe- people who are Jewish are under assault, under attack. And I've said repeatedly, like, Issue condemnatory statements. Like, just condemn this. This is this is wrong. Yeah. I mean, the same people screaming about microaggressions. You don't have to take a political stance. In fact, I don't think universities should take a political stance about anything. I, but I the, agree. Yeah, but the fact that 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 Jews are under assault in in the society and it's particularly on university campuses, which is their purview, it seems to be the lowest of low hanging fruit. They won't do it. Okay, let me tell you. I want to tell you. Wrap up real quick with two things. You know, you said something years ago, you taught me something. I want to tell you, I don't know if I ever told you this, but you told me something that was great. I was asking you why, um, mil- I think this is in Canada, we had this conversation a decade ago. Why is it that 
radicals, radical Islamists are against secularism. Do you remember this conversation? And I said, it would seem that they would love secularism because they would get to be radicals and then everybody would get to do everything they want and everybody would be happy. And you told me, because they don't want everybody else to do what they want. They want everybody else to believe what they believe. Yeah. And that was a huge light bulb for me. Like that was a, that kind of, not le less so that one particular thing, but how that weaves its way through thinking. How that one idea that if we have, and you can substitute secularism for anything else, like we want everybody to believe this. And it's not that we want everyone to have cognitive liberty, believe whatever they want. We want people to believe what we believe. Yeah. And when you start thinking about the conversation that way, I think it changes. Okay. You're a very close friend. You're an awesome human being. I love you like a brother. Where can people find you? Um, well, Ideas Beyond Borders is one of the easiest way to find me, but I'm also available on Facebook, Twitter, everything. So they can just search my name and find me there. And Faisal Amutar. Yes. Faisal Saeed Al Mutar. That's the way to pronounce it in Arabic, but it's a. Uh -huh. uh, but people, it's the easiest way to remember my name is Face with Al. Faisal. Faisal. Yes. Faisal, Faisal. Saeed Al Mutar. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me, Peter. Right, this thanks, is, this is amazing. It. Appreciate Appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Everything we do is under the umbrella of the National Progress Alliance, nationalprogressalliance.org. It's a nonprofit, independent 501c3. Your generous donations keep us going and keep fueling content like this. So please help us out. Make a donation. We very much appreciate it. Thank you.